Welcome to Esoteric Thoughts. Michael, can you talk to us about the creation of hell, the primary concept of fear in religion? Yeah, I'd be glad to. Well, it's not a Christian concept. They got it really late in the day. Numerous other cultures have it, you know, whether it's Hades, Tartarus, the Celts had it as Anwin or Anvin, something like that. Uh, you've got Sheol and the Jews. Uh, you've got Avernus, uh, the Lake of Fire, whatever, you know, uh, the, but uh, the way into what it is, it actually comes from the north. We'll talk about that in a minute. The northern climbs is the origin of it. A goddess called Hell, H E L. But the way to really embark upon that subject, it's a fascinating subject, where did it come from? Is the imagery alone. Fire and brimstone, uh, an eternal place of uh, burning and torture and damnation. Once we make the change and understand these are not metaphysical realities, they're actually physical. They actually explain something that happened on this planet volcanoes, earthquakes, torrents, comets, all that. So it's not Christian, but the three go-tos that I refer people to, let's see if we can do justice to the all three. The first is that, um, and this turns up a lot in fiction, like Tolkien with his dead marshes and stinking uh, battle zones and what have you, right? Uh, uh, blackened trees and places of infernal spirits. It's the story of an ancestral race that was uh, genocide was committed upon them and that was almost entirely wiped out. And I talk about this in the Atlantis book. And so that is the origin of it. Uh, it was preserved in the memory, you know, of later races. Groups like the Aboriginals uh, all know about this. So I cover it in the Atlantis book. Then the main theme of the Atlantis book, though, is the coming of the Nephilim or the coming of the Anunnaki, as they've been called the fallen angels. And as you work through that story, you find out that a massive war took place, basically of atomic levels. And that is also preserved in ancient chronicles, although many documents pertaining to it have been suppressed. Nevertheless, there's still uh, references, say in the Ramayana and the Mahabhatra about nuclear war. And you can find it in the Bible. If you read Ezekiel and Isaiah and Jeremiah, if you read these things properly, you'll find out that it's there as well. Uh, so the devastation that was then caused by that Holocaust rent the world. This uh, humanoid destruction where rival forces on this planet after the fallen angels came here. It was a, a, a <clears throat> I'm not a ufologist who believes that, uh, you know, these are golden brothers who are going to come in the future and save us from ourselves, which is 99.9% .9 of the ufology movement today believes this nonsense and you may have you've, if you're watching things like ancient aliens on tv you know they they keep on harping on this which already should tell you that to watch out right no no, no. this was an evil force and it, it's remembered as the fall of satan the fall of lucifer is actually the mem the memory and the reliving the replaying of an actual fall from heaven of very very physical beings who came here and then after they had set up their uh, status quo, you know, their headquarters was Atl Atlantis, and they started all sorts of bizarre programs. They had the human race go and dig for minerals, especially gold. They had them basically in servitude. They messed with their DNA because they were much more advanced than us. And they made all sorts of hybrid creatures, you know, which mythology is full of. It's an incredible story. But then there was a certain rebel action against them. They were so evil that they... Earth rebelled against them and a war broke out. Or I, I also show the alternative that within the gods, there was a splitting that took place and rival factions warred against each other. And this war devastated our planet. And in the bulk of the Atlantis book, I bring up the evidence of flora and fauna death. The evidence for this is actually here. Atomic war is actually here in the, ge in the geological record. And such frightful fauna death. Uh, caves in France and England and in other places, you've just been absolutely filled with millions and millions of tiny bones. How, how, how could that possibly have happened? And, and uh, uh, anthropologists will always tell you that this earth has been visited through the millennia by, the, by, by different cataclysms. It's not to say that cataclysms didn't exist, 
but there were some that kind of stood out and they were recorded in human memory. So we're not just talking about, oh, millions of years ago, the planet was devastated or other planets in the cosmos. That's all accepted. We know that. But coming up more to the Paleolithic, coming up to you know 50,000 years ago and moving on, there's other odd conflagrations that took place that uh, stand out and have even been recorded by the ancient mythographers. But one of the other motifs, then uh, the... Uh, you see, so hell. So when you go back, then you find out that either this ancestral group that I told you was wiped out moved to the northern climes, which weren't snow covered. It was called Ver Perpetuum, eternal spring in the north before the pole shift and all that. And this ancestral primordial group sort of fortified their remnants. There was not very many of them left and they went to the north and formed what was known as the Arctic homeland. It plays a big role in my work, uh, my 22 part series, Path of the Fool, uh, which is on Unslaved also goes into this. And later on, the Arctic homeland fell and, and after it fell, many of its motifs poured down into the rest of the world. They're the aria that poured down, right? The, the blonde, white, uh, sort of uh, blue-eyed dudes whose ethos and their elements of their tradition are to be found in India with the, the pre-Vedics uh, and in many other cultures too. And so Swedes and you know, your, your sort of later Celts and your Finns uh, are all descendants by blood of the Arctic homeland which was the supreme, it's actually the Paradiso, it's the real Garden of Eden, was actually a physical place in the north, the Arctic homeland, in a paradisical place. And later on, after I'd studied this many years later, we came across Finnish mythology that confirmed all of this. And again, if you go to Unslaved and type in Bok Saga, B-O-C-K, Bok Saga, uh, you'll find confirmation because the ancient Finnish mythology unpacks all of this better than almost any mythology. But there are other mythologies as well. But the Bach saga, Bach is a word for goat. So these were the goat men of the north. It's where the word goth comes from. So when you say Gothic or Gothenburg, you know, or Gotland up in Sweden, exactly that, just the mere tracking of that word takes you right back to what I'm saying. So the Arctic homeland finally did fall. Udenma crashed. It was assaulted from two sides of the planet by the Christians from Constantinople and the, and the Christians from Rome. After the creation of Christianity, the two groups got together, but the only time they ever did get together, but they wanted to ransack the Arctic homeland or what was left of it. I mean, the Arctic homeland had really already fallen, but what was left of it, the remnants, the actual remnants of the remnants of the remnants finally were appropriated by the uh, Constantinople church of the Orthodox church and the Roman church did get together, assaulted in a massive army. This has all been scrubbed from history. Went up to Finland and basically massacred every single woman and child and, and man who lived there and ransacked the teachings and took it back uh, to their home, you know, back to the Vatican and back to Constantinople, where they've been going through that information for centuries. And this is uh, exposed through the study of heraldry and flags and etymology, stuff we've gone into in great detail on Unslave. So when they went up there, they discovered as part of the mythology of the North, a goddess called Hel, H-E-L. And they found a goddess called Ertha, or sometimes it's with an H, Hertha, from which we get the word earth. So both the, both the word earth and the word Hel come from Scandinavian goddesses. They found a goddess called Is, that is the equivalent of Isis. They found a god called uh, Udin that became the Garden of Eden, a goddess, and goddess of the apple tree, and on and on we get goddess of the serpent. And all of this was abstracted and put into the Christian gospels by Constantine and, and the later you know, patriarchs of the Bible and all of this, and then translated again and again, you know, massaged and changed. But they're all in there, all these Nordic gods and goddesses and concepts. The very idea of the Garden of Hesperides in Greece that turns up as the Garden of Eden actually came from the Nordic box. And the, the, the box are those who remember their ancestry. But the strange thing there is that they're one of the peoples 
who claim that the ancestry, their ancestry, the ancestry of Earthman is millions of years old. It doesn't go back to the Paleolithic. It goes way before that. And that we've been lied to royally about the age of the human race and about the age of the planet. And whatever was left of this ancestral wisdom was taken to the north, to the Arctic homeland, which was known in Greek mythology as Hyperborea, also known as Tula, ultimate Tula, also known as Polaris, Polaria, Arctos. There's many, all the different cultures of the world speak about this, even in China. The China, uh, China was invaded in the early days by a group of people called the Ainu, A-I-N-U. They bear an, they're fair, they're blonde, and they, they, uh, there's another group called uh, Pazarix. There's another group called Tokarians all over in China and Asia. And when they dig up their graves, they're wearing tartan. The women's hair is braided. Only in Denmark do you find that kind of braiding. Only. Talk about fingerprints. And they're white and blue dyed anyway. All right. And so all over the world, and you read my Irish Origins of Civilization, I go into all of this in great detail, and even on the website, irishoriginsofcivilization.com, to show the evidence. So Persians, Scythians, the influence of, and this was the fracture of the Arctic homeland in which all of this knowledge and gnosis poured down. With it came the theory of hell. The Jews picked up on it. They have Sheol. And Sheol is very close to hell because it's not a hell. It's a purgatory. So the Jewish concept of the underworld where spirits go after they're dead is almost identical to the halls of the goddess hell in which especially brave warriors will lie and languish to heal their wounds, to sleep and wait the call of Odin for the final battle of Armageddon. Battle of Armageddon? Yeah. It's a Viking concept. It's pre-Viking. It's from the north. Didn't in, see, so we have to tra track these elements. And Hungarian mythology is full of this as well, because the Hungarians damn well know that they're related to the Finns. The, the closest languages in Europe are Finnish, of all places, and Hungary. The scholars are just bewildered. They can't explain it. Well, it's easy to explain. These great migrations, the Scythians or the Scythians, who even got as far as Egypt. There's a city there called Scythopolis. This incredible movement. I could go on for, and as I say, type in Box Saga into our search engine over there, you know, as a member, and you'll get just uh, amazing information about this. And Professor Tolkien was a scholar of all of this. Finland was his favorite country, Finnish mythology, their, their, their sacred book is called the Kalevala. He knew it inside out in the original language. And he went and studied the proto-Kalevala and the proto-Eddas and why Edda is Veda, Vedas in the East and Edda in the West. What's going on here? Sacred, and there happened to be two holy books featuring pretty much the same uh, accounts. So the cult of hell is a goddess who has a great underground cavern in which people, uh, the souls of the dead come to rest. But the demented psychotic minds of your Christian fathers, well, well we, can, we can do better than that. So the three go-tos are a worldwide devastation which the earth was burning. I haven't got to the third one yet. These are the first two. The earth was burning in a genocidal war, the remnants of which went to various places, but the north is the most important uh, stronghold. It finally fell, but they, uh, that's the old Atlantis. It's uh, Atslan. It's remembered in the, in the holy books, but I just call it the Arctic homeland. Paradise, walled garden, etc. Mythologies are full of it. The second is the war of the gods as told by Zacharias Sitchin and other great scholars to show, oh, there was this war, and it is remembered in the Bible. And the third one to go to is a comet. The coming of a comet that burned our world to a cinder, practically, and already had damaged other planets in our solar system. Some scholars think it plunged, a comet plunged all the way through Jupiter and ejected uh, Mars and the moon with such force and continued going. And then as it started to die out, it became the planet Venus. In ancient times, Venus was called Venus Barbata, the, the bearded goddess. Well, that's a comet. The motif of a witch on her broomstick is Venus, the comet. The thunderbolts of the gods, they're always seen holding a thunderbolt or a trident. That's the comet. And so comet imagery 
permeates our world. If you go and watch my program, The Monstrous Feminine, I'll show how even women are connected to this, uh, a cult of women. But the Satian Atnists that I talk about and indict as the form, one of the foremost evil cults of the world, Set was Satan, was Seth, was Shaitan, was Shaddai, is the comet. The god Set is the personification on earth of the comet and the devastation of the comet. Which, and Set is what? Satan. Well, Satan's the ruler of what? Hell and the underworld. See how it connects? So the devastation of the comet is another go-to for the concept of hell. It made the earth into a bottomless pit. It killed, people just dropped dead because the, the petroleum uh, uh, and even the falling of, of uh, meteors that burned up the world and the gases that just uh, uh, suffocated villages and towns, you know, when you hear about the great dragon flying in the sky, like you see in Tolkien's The Hobbit and breathing fire. When you hear about the Nazgul, for those who follow Tolkien's Lord of the Rings, what do you think the Nazgul are? Where did that image come from? Flying demons or whatever, right? The Chinese preserve it, the Irish. Meteors would fall in Ireland, in Britain, of course. Just like there are literally tens of thousands of meteor holes in Oklahoma and Kentucky alone. Georgia. Georgia is peppered with hundreds and hundreds, if not thousands of meteor holes. Did you know that? Well, the same thing was happening in Ireland. That's why Irish mythology says that great dragons would fall out of the sky into lakes that became completely evil and demonized for centuries. Even up to modern times, women wouldn't go and collect water from a certain well because they believed that a demon was in it and a dark angel or a dragon had boiled it. In the stories of Cúlhullan, the great god of Ireland, if he walked into the ocean, it would boil. Where, what the, where is it all coming from? Well, it, you'd soon find out. You got Baylor of the evil eye, a demonic god that turns up as Goliath in the Bible. Where did that motif come from? And the eye being put out or the stone being thrown. The young hero, you wouldn't even have hero mythology without this because the hero is nobody without the demon monster, Beowulf uh, and Grandel, right? St. Michael and the dragon, on and on it goes, Osiris and Set. You can't even have hero mythology. There's, do you know how many volumes are written on the hero and they never mention this? That it's a cosmic event? But it burned up the world so bad that people went out of their minds. When we talked earlier about Julian James's theory of the bicameral mind, we said that James couldn't come up very strongly with a reason why this breakdown of the mind took place and why we started hearing voices of instruction, meaning verbal hallucinations. I can tell you easily, and especially if you plug in your Emanuel Volokovsky's and Commons Beaumont's, it's very easy to explain. It's the psychosis, the mental meltdown, the mania created by terrestrial events of cataclysm. Because many a book, even by the great geologists, is written about cataclysm. What, what do you think the human race just sat back in its armchairs watching Netflix while this was all going on? We ran wild. We were worse than animals. The animals were howling and howling and howling all day and night. They've gone out of their minds. This is all recorded in history. And so the story of hell comes out of this. So whether you have Hades, Anwin, the river of, of Avernus, uh, the, river of, the river of Leith, which was the river of forgetfulness, fucking right, forgetfulness. We are literally cognitively dissociated because we have blocked the memory of everything I'm talking about. And that's called your unconscious. It's one of the reasons you go to sleep at night. And if you have nightmares that can be linked back to this, we still remember this. This wound is still born and burning at the center of the psyche. It's one of the re reasons for the origin of, of religion. And in religion appears the motif. So a long way around to explain your question, we need religion as a stabilizer for the trauma that we have, you know, the ancestral trauma that we suffered centuries ago, it's still burning there as a wound in the psyche. But in our religions, we've reprised because we have to live it through. All trauma is lived through. Remember the road you don't want to go on because you had an accident, so you'll go three times longer around the block out of your way to avoid the one road you had this terrible accident on? That's what we're talking about. But strangely, there also needs to be a processing of the wound, psychologically speaking. So we brought back hell into the canon, into the mythography, because we need to process that physical experience, but we do it in a way that's a little bit more softened, a way that's a little bit more uh, negotiable, and protected, and explained. But what we're really doing, it's not to do with religion and God and anything else, 
is because we are reliving actual phylogenetic memories, but we're doing it in a way that's you know comfortable. And this goes for many other things. The parting of the Red Sea, the comet. The making of a desert, the comet. The leveling of trees, ferocious, uh, when they say armies were toppled, like you hear in the Mahabharata. And a, a whole armies were just devastated, or wiped off the face of the earth. The great uh, plagues, the great, uh, read Ezekiel. Read the book of Revelation, the devastation. You hear about it in the book of Genesis with the uh, great deluge. We are living, religion is mostly a way of processing actual physical events that prove so traumatic to our ancestors' minds that they literally went out of their minds. And the only ones who were left were left in a highly fragmented psychic state. And so what we call history is the patch-up job, an attempt to deal with catastrophism and to try and patch back a sense of consciousness. So Julian James is one answer to that, but there's elements he didn't understand himself. You know, then the next step is to go to Velikovsky. He knew more, and then you carry on. And I've carried on these great men's work because it, you know they died, and you have to bring in other scholars. You know, like I said, the Bach saga, which is only known until very recently. So in my work, uh, we're way out ahead because we're bringing to bear uh, theories that weren't in in the known to us in Europe. And as I said, the, the, the Finnish mythology, which is a great cache of this information that is so precious, was absconded with. It's taken many great scholars like Jim Chesnar and others that uh, we've interviewed to piece this together. And it's by no means an easy job. And we owe them a massive debt because their work really explains something amazing. You know, and it needs all of this to come to the table. Who's even heard of the Arctic homeland? Uh, and a, a great scholar who wrote Arctic homeland in the Vedas, uh, Tillak, he was referring to a book called Paradise Found by a previous scholar who had actually gone to the Upanishads. Both men went to the Indian Vedas, right? They went to the Vedas, the greatest holy books of India, the Upanishads and the Puranas. These are all the priestly works. And in the Vedas, strangely, in the Vedas, the Holy Vedas, which people have dated from almost 10,000 years BC. That's how early these works go, you know, the proto, the proto Vedas. In the Vedas, there's often many anecdotes about the position of stars. You know, you're writing a story, these men were writing stories, but they put in a lot of astronomical detail, like the position of the sun. You get this in Celtic mythology too, but just to stick with the Vedas. And this allowed later astronomers, like, and people who are into this, like Tillak, to actually go back and find out that when these astrological alignments are mentioned in the sacred scriptures, they couldn't have been seen from India. They couldn't have even been seen from Northern India. Now this had been separately discovered by uh, an astronomer called Bailey, one of the world's greatest early astronomers. But these guys over in India found out the same thing, that not one of the constellational movements of the year, say a description of the seasons, for instance, can actually be seen from anywhere in India. But you can see those, and those are anecdotes that would have been installed and you know, immortalized and then described in writing by people who came from far, much farther north. Well, this was scrubbed. The Indians didn't want to hear about this, you know, the Aryan invasion. It's not an invasion anyway, but they, they didn't. The scholars there uh, were uh, not inclined to uh, uh, accept anymore that culture had come from the outside. It's just a personal prejudice that they had. But sadly, Tillak's work and other men who had written on this subject, who clearly proved that what we call Indian culture is based on the Arya, these, these, these northerners, these blonde, blue-eyed northerners, that was scrubbed in the 20th, 19th and 20th century. And of course, and then a piece got lost. Well, I went and studied it and factored it back in. Hyperborea, Hyperborea, all the ancient Sikhs descend from those people, the Sikhs. And the, the highest caste of ja, uh, the highest caste of Sikh, the highest caste of Sikhs is called Jat. Not too far away from goat or gat or Jat 
it's, it is actually a derivation of this of the ancient Nordic word goat people. And the fact that the Sikhs are warlike and aquiline and very uh, you know tall and all of this is is I mean that's accepted. That's not even debatable. The Sikhs know clearly where they're from. You know, and they worship the holy mountain, right? You'll see the holy mountain motif turning up in even the Shivites. The Shiva always has a mountain, a white mountain behind him. Yeah, Arctic homeland, mate. And you see the river of wisdom. They even have it in their imagery. So that takes us back to what I said before. When you want to unpack the imagery of something like hell, not just hell, but hell is a very important one. Think of it as terrestrial. The bottom is split, the fires uh, and all the rest of it were damned souls go. We were those damned souls. We were the ones screaming in pain. We were the ones you know, crying about our sins because early man probably did think this was all also brought on by something he had done. Might have even been right. So the three are the ancestral race uh, wiped out. The second plausible one, and this is all based on texts, fictional and non-fictional, is the idea of a war of the gods, which burned the world up. And the third one is the coming of a comet. And we're leaving our time here, you know, which one came first and all that. Let's not bother with that. So these are the three great uh, motifs that I, I always go to when you need to explain motifs like that. The Christian fathers just used it to scare the hell out of everyone. Saying we're going to take this motif that we found in the ancient uh, myths of uh, the North. Uh, they all believed it, so we're going to take that one. And wow, as a, as a bedtime story, it scares the bejesus out of everybody. So, you know, let's just keep on with that one. And since you do legitimately find it in Tibet, you find the mo motif of the underworld everywhere. So they just took that motif and spiced it up, made it into more of a Hollywood extravaganza, you know, to scare everyone. And that's what we're left with. But if you study its origins, you find out something so immensely interesting. It's, it's, that's the real dumbfounding aspect. 